Hello, everybody, and welcome to Stockton University. I'm very excited to uh, welcome everybody here today. I would like to, everybody to know that this is being recorded. So um, if you don't want to be recorded, please don't ask a question later, and you'll be fine. Um, I'd like to welcome Mary Pat, our moderator today, and get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is thank you to all of you for coming out on a hot summer day. You could have been at the beach, but uh, it's very important that we get the facts out. So I greatly appreciate everybody coming out. Just by a very quick uh, way of introduction, my name is Mary Pat Angelini. I'm a former legislator. I served in the New Jersey Assembly for eight years, and I've been in the field of drug prevention for close to 30, I'm ashamed to say. Um, and uh, this has really been my, my life's work. I'm currently the CEO of Preferred Behavioral Health Group. Today, I want to have a conversation, and it's going to be very conversational in uh, the format. And then there'll be opportunities for questions at the end. And there's a microphone set up right over here if uh, anyone has questions. So again, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to introduce Patrick Kennedy, Congressman Patrick Kennedy. He's a former congressman from Rhode Island and the founder of the Kennedy Forum. He co-founded One Mind, and he was a commissioner on the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. During his 16 years in Congress, Patrick fought to end discrimination against mental illness, addiction, and other brain diseases. He's best known as the lead sponsor of the groundbreaking Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which was passed with bipartisan support and signed into law by President George W. Bush. In addition to the federal parity law, Kennedy authored and co-sponsored dozens of bills during his time in Congress to increase the understanding and treatment of neurological and psychiatric disorders. In 2013, he founded the Kennedy Forum, whose mission is to lead a national dialogue on transforming mental health and addiction care delivery by uniting mental health advocates, business leaders, and community agencies really just common sense, but unfortunately, it doesn't happen, and I greatly appreciate your leadership on this issue. Likewise, Mary Pat. In the spring of 2017, Kennedy was appointed, Mr. Kennedy was appointed to serve on the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. The commission, chaired by New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, studied ways to combat and treat the scourge of drug abuse and addiction in the United States. He has been formally recognized for his mental health advocacy and leadership many times over and is the recipient of many awards. Most importantly, he is the husband of Amy and he just had his fifth, they just had their fifth child. So congratulations, congratulations. Patrick. Thank you very much. And then I'm gonna go ahead and, yes, please, let's give him a round of applause. I'm going to uh, then also just get the introductions out of the way. Ijoma Apara, I've had the pleasure of getting to know her through this fight against marijuana legalization, and uh, she's just a delight. She's a senior policy advisor for New Jersey RAMP, as well as a research fellow for a program funded by a grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, working with youth and their families in drug use and abuse prevention in the city of Patterson. Additionally, Ms. Apara is funded by the National Institute on Health as a doctoral fellow fellow, excuse me, in the behavioral health sciences training in drug abuse research at NYU. Before pursuing her doctorate, Ijoma worked as a youth and family therapist in New York City. In addition to conducting research and advocating for policy change, she teaches at Columbia University School of Social Work. She also teaches substance abuse policy at the Silberman School of Social Work at the City University of New York. Ms. Opara earned a master's in social work from NYU, a master of public health in epidemiology from New York Medical <laughs> College, and received her BA in psychology from New Jersey City University. She's currently pursuing her PhD in the Department of Family Science and Human Development at Montclair State. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> So the topic of today's seminar or discussion, conversation, is legalization in New Jersey. Do we really want it? Is that really what we want for our beautiful garden state? 
So I'd like to just open up the floor and ask Patrick what, and Patrick, as you know, or I don't think I did mention, is a native of New Jersey, lives in New Jersey. So what do you think about New Jersey legalizing recreational use? Well, first, thanks, Mary Pat, for your long advocacy. And so much does happen in the state legislature, and thanks for your service there. Um, and Ms. Apara, it's really an honor to be with you. What a distinguished uh, CV you already have. You look too young <laughs> to have all those credits, but you are, you know, you're getting supported in your doctorate degree by the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, which is the lead agency researching uh, this issue. So for those who are in the audience, uh, not only does she have a distinguished career in, in child development, um, but she also is particularly uh, recognized. You don't become a fellow at the NIH, let alone the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, if you're not really sharp. So uh, <laughs> we're honored that you're here. Uh, you can help correct me as we go along on everything. No, you're doing fine. OK, so, uh, so this is the big conundrum here. Um, we really don't need, we were talking before, to put up a bunch of slides, although I have them. <laughs> uh, to talk about the fact if you legalize, you essentially commercialize, which of course opens up access. And the more access you have, you have more people that use. And if a certain percentage of that population who uses um, is prone to addiction, as I have been, uh, then they're be going to become addicted. And so the X factor of additional problems of addiction uh, and the other mental health problems that come from marijuana use, it's not a surprise to say that all of that's going to uh, blow up with the expansion because uh, by laws of reason, you know, more people use, more people have this, more people are going to get addicted, more people are not going to get promotions, more people are not going to get A's and Bs, um, more people are not going to move on with their lives in a way they wouldn't otherwise move on because for a certain percentage of the population, and certainly not nearly the majority, but for a small percentage of the population, um, this is going to be something that takes them out of the game of life. And uh, I came into this because I'm an advocate, obviously, for the parity law that I had the honor of authoring while I was a member of Congress. And that parity law says that we ought to address mental health illnesses and addiction illnesses the same as we do cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. What a revolutionary concept, right? That we ought to treat illnesses of the brain the same way as we treat all other illnesses of the body. But a funny thing happened as I was going around the country uh, talking about how we could make our country more mentally well through the application of the parity law whereby more people could gain access to treatment for depression and anxiety and a whole host of illnesses. Um, I was running up against the fact that while all this was happening, we have this big debate on legalizing a, a new drug just after we've seen the effects of what money behind an addictive drug has meant in terms of the opioid crisis. Because frankly, we all know now that Purdue Pharma um, was putting their foot on the accelerator to get more people to take Oxycontin because it meant more money for them. So you have the combination of a profit motive combined with an addictive substance. And guess what? The public health issue gets run right over. Now, my late father, Senator Edward Kennedy, was the champion of trying to rein in the effects of big tobacco. I think there was no one in the United States that did more to fight the big tobacco companies uh, than le my late father, other than maybe the people that got the consent lawsuit that finally got the tobacco industry to admit that they were lying about the addictive impact of nicotine. But of course, we had to lose millions of Americans because for years, 
the big tobacco CEOs lied to Congress and to the American people, basically saying, oh, it's not so bad. And every time I hear people talk about marijuana in the same way, it's not so bad. You know, some voice goes off in my head like, I think I've heard this before. Not only have I heard it before with respect to big tobacco, but I've heard it before with respect to Oxycontin. Because everyone said, oh, that's okay. It's, uh, you know, medically prescribed. You know, and so forth. Of course, the risk factor of it was reduced because everyone said, well, I got prescribed. Mm -hmm. It can't be anything wrong. My doctor prescribed it. And the same mentality is going to be the mentality with uh, commercialized marijuana because now everyone's going to say, well, it's called medical marijuana. You know, people are taking it for this and this and this. It must be okay. And it's that de-risking is what we call it, de-risking, meaning the, the harm that people feel they're going to get into if they use is reduced, which not surprisingly corresponds to an increased rate of use. So the more particularly kids see this as a non-issue, then the more kids use. And that's why in all the states that have legalized, the number of teenage use of marijuana, not surprisingly, has skyrocketed. Now, I know there are many in all these audiences that I address that are libertarians who believe, you know, well, I'm an adult, I ought to be able to smoke and all the rest, and I, like, I've got no argument with that. If we could keep it confined to the adults. But unfortunately, because of neuroscience, we know that children's brains are not fully developed until their mid-twenties. And so the most deleterious impact of marijuana is particularly on kids and the developing brain. And they're going to be the ones that end up getting targeted with the advertising the most because they're going to, the ones that do become lifelong consumers, I mean, that's, that's the cash cow for the big industry of marijuana. And and, and they can all say, well, we can regulate this. You've heard that before, Mary Pat, on every issue. But we all know the government doesn't stand a chance of regulating this thing compared to the big money that's going to be advertising this stuff everywhere. Now, I, um, while I was in Congress, um, was always voting for more regulation on the liquor industry. Because, frankly, we lose more people to alcoholism in this country than we do to opioids. Almost twice as much. We lose nearly 100,000 people to alcoholism every year. We lose 64,000 to opioids and other drugs. Most people don't know that because it's insidious. It comes, the death rate comes in a myriad of different ways, not as dramatic as the overdose, but nonetheless very deadly. And we have seen an uh, uh, universal kind of advertising uh, on cable television of hard liquor for the last several years and that is bad for our public health. So I just want to say I'm an equal opportunity pro mental health reducing addiction person. I, I want to regulate uh, the, the alcohol industry more but you know it also, also should tell us if the alcohol industry can basically run with impunity, and by the way, there were, I think, eight lobbyists for every member of Congress from the liquor industry when I was in Washington, D.C., and I bet it's almost the same in the state legislatures, where most of the regulation, frankly, happens. Once this horse gets out of the barn, honest to God, the notion that we in government are going to stand a prayer of a chance to regulate an industry with that much money and influence behind it. Frankly, as, as Mary Pat can attest, it's very close to slim and none. And the <coughs> and, and it's and and it's the impact of that is obviously gonna be on more people thinking that it's not a big deal to drink, it's not a big deal to smoke, and um, at the end of the day, I think we as a society collectively pay a huge price for us, let alone individuals who are living in families who are impacted by uh, these illnesses. Um, 
So that is the very long answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Pat. Thank you. That's uh, excellent. And we have so many um, colleagues. I have colleagues I see um, from the drug prevention field. So I think in part we're preaching to the choir, but I think it's very, very important for everybody to to get some information and to share it with your friends and your neighbors. You know, those of us that are in this field, we live it. We're talking about it all the time. But the rest of the country is, the rest of the state, you know, they're, they're off to the beach. I mean, it's not, this is not their primary focus. So that's what we have to keep remembering. And um, I'm gonna keep putting a plug in throughout the day uh, for NJ Ramp. There was information outside, uh, it's NJ Ramp. Dot org, and that, again, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, it stands for New Jersey Responsible Approaches to Marijuana Policy. Um, there's information there out in the foyer, and you can link right to your legislator. And again, that's what I'm going to keep saying and reminding people. The legislators need to know how you feel about this issue because it's the summertime and things, funny things can happen in Trenton when you know, no one's looking and they think everyone's at the beach. So I'll, I'll remind everybody about that in a little bit. Joma, you work with youth and you talk about, um, in the drug prevention world, we talk about perception mm -hmm. and a youth's perception. Talk about that, but also couple that with some of the experiences that we've found in Colorado and California, where these dispensaries end up, mm. in which neighborhoods? Yeah. So a part of the work that I do is I work for a drug-free communities grant. So I do a lot of community work in the city of Patterson, but before then I'm, I'm also a licensed social worker and I work directly with youth of color in um, predominantly urban, urban communities in New York City. And often when I talk to youth and educate them about drug use and educate them about other um, associated behaviors or drug use like sexual risk behavior, what they've told me is that, oh yeah, we know cigarettes are bad. Cigarettes cause cancer. Yeah, we're not gonna smoke cigarettes, but marijuana's not a big deal. It's, it's legal. So what's the, what's, the, what's the big deal? It's legal in Colorado. If the government's regulating it, how could it be dangerous? It cures cancer. It, you know, it, it does all these different things that, you know, that they're assuming that you know, it does because of the mis misconception of marijuana. And the problem with legalization that people need to understand is that the perception of risk does become lowered. You know, that's, a, that's an issue, because when perception of risk is lowered, then you're going to have not only increase in usage, but an increase in first time users. And these are probably going to be people that, are, that may be prone to addiction. And these are already people that are living in communities that already lack mental health um, treatment, already lack substance abuse treatment. So what are they going to do? This is going to end up you know, really destroying and hurting their lives and hurting their futures. And I, and I, won't, you know, I won't lie, I think I, I hear a lot about the social justice argument with the legalization, and I totally understand it. I, I work directly in the field. I've worked in an alternative to incarceration program where youth of color and their families were, were, were devastated by the criminal justice system because their children were caught with marijuana or were selling marijuana and they were you know, sentenced to, to jail or prison or probation. I totally get it. But then I've worked with, as a social worker, I've actually worked with youth and they've told me, like, I, don't, I can't stop smoking. You know, I, you know I, I have all these other issues. I have anxiety, I'm depressed, I'm this, I'm that. They don't seek any, you know, they're not able to seek treatment, and we need to be able to address that. They're in the, the, what we're seeing also in regards to marijuana with youth in, in Colorado is that even though you know, we're talking about the social justice issue and you know, black and Latino um, men and women get arrested at higher rates than whites, which is true, you know, I definitely acknowledge that, and this is why I'm for decriminalization, but what we're, see what we're seeing in Colorado is that youth of color arrest rates have gone up. It's gone up by 60% ever since marijuana became, recreational marijuana became legalized. We have to address that. So, and, and this is public information, and I'm worried that this is going to happen to New Jersey. I've talked to legislators in New Jersey, and I've actually have done the work and talked to um, Senator Sweeney's staff and talked to other legislators who are, you know, who are for this movement and asked them, what are you going to do to address that? How are you going to address the negative impact that this may have on urban communities that already lack resources to, to treat the drug problems that are already happening? We haven't even really dealt with the alcohol issue, tobacco issues, opioid crisis, and now we're adding another drug and we're disguising it as a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's, it's, it's absurd to me. And, you know, and, and they have no answer. You know, and, that, and that's what scares me. So I, I do understand that people 
there are people that smoke marijuana or that do want to use marijuana and they don't they never get addicted to it. I understand that. I understand the recreational use of marijuana, but we have to we have to look at look at tobacco and alcohol as examples. It's not reassuring to me that legislators tell me, "Oh, we're just going to regulate like we're regulating mm -hmm. alcohol." Right. That's not reassuring. Alcohol is actually the number one substance used by teenagers in this country. Marijuana is the number one illicit, you know, substance, and we have to understand, like you know, Congressman Kennedy mentioned, that alcohol does cause a majority of the problems, and there are a majority of negative health outcomes more in depths associated with alcohol than than opioids. But we have to also remember too that al the use of alcohol is very normalized. The use of tobacco is very normalized because they're legal, not because they're more dangerous than than opioids. They're, they're, these are legal drugs, and it took the nation about over like 50 years for them for people to start realizing, oh wow, tobacco actually is associated with cancer. You know, let's, 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 start, let's start now forcing tobacco companies to put out all these advertisements saying that you know, this, this smoking this product is actually going to kill people. Let's, it, it took 50 years for that. I don't want to see that again with marijuana, especially with the communities that I work with who are already lacking resources to fight all these, um, the substance use disorder anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I could. Mary yes. Pa so Ms. Opara, this is a really interesting mm -hmm. phenomenon that I think illustrates the real um, fallacy in uh, Governor Murphy and other uh, proponents of uh, legalization when arguing that it's a social justice issue because they're conflating the real uh, need to correct mm -hmm. the war on drugs yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. and yet uh, they're not addressing the underlying bias in the criminal justice system against people of color. And what they're saying is they're using this popular movement as a, as a, as a way for them to excuse what they know or they should know as an educated person um, is an inexcusable thing, like putting the public health at risk by commercializing an addictive substance that causes so many known mental health and addictive uh, issues. Um, what we ought to do if we're really interested in reducing the disproportionate population of African American, Hispanic um, uh, people in our uh, jails and prisons is we ought to look at real criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if you're really interested in reducing the burden on um, communities of color of uh, an onerous criminal justice system that, that really uh, tragically impacts so many people of color, then address that as opposed to thinking that you're um, doing it by commercializing a drug. And, and by the way, your point that it's going to somehow reduce the arrests of people of color is nonsense. And the evidence now is in. The evidence shows there's actually an increase in arrests because you see, a, a, a biased uh, law enforcement official is going to arrest someone of color for another infraction. Yeah, legalization is not going to, legalization of marijuana is not going to change that. You know, and I think people need to really understand that we do have a serious systemic issue in the criminal justice system and why people of color are targeted and why they're criminalized. But not even just that, we have to also understand why is it that urban communities, you know, speaking in New Jersey, why are they under-resourced? We have to address those structural factors that are causing people to use and why there are lack of mental health and substance abuse treatment centers in these communities. We have to talk about poverty. We have to talk about lack of health care. You know, these are serious issues. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about education. How do we fix the education system in, in inner city communities? No one's talking about that. If he really wants to address a social justice issue, let's figure out how do we improve the, the graduation rate in, in urban high schools. Let's, let's talk about that. How do we encourage more black and Latino youth to be able to get into college with full scholarships? These are, these are serious issues that are not being addressed. You know? So I think it's insulting to say that, oh, legalizing marijuana is somehow going to help people of color when you're not even addressing all the other systemic issues that are hurting us. And, and, and you compound that with the fact that uh, liquor stores are eight times more likely to be in a minority neighborhood than an all-white neighborhood. Speaking of liquor stores, I'm sorry, I don't mean go to for it. Uh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the work that I do in Patterson is that, I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with Patterson, it's about two hours away from here, but we've battled for years how to reduce alcohol outlet density in Patterson. Because of flawed legislation, this is why it's very important for people to really understand 
what the bill, what bills are being passed and what their legislators are fighting for because if you don't focus on this now, you're going to reap the consequences in like 20, 30 years. So what we were see, what we found in Patterson was that Patterson has three times the, the the amount of liquor stores that are actually legally allowed because of grand because liquor stores were grandfathered in. So they're actually supposed to have about 60 liquor stores, but they have about 100 and, 140, even more than that. Some of them are even there are even more that are that are illegal, and they just keep rising. We've talked to youth, we've talked to parents and community leaders who've talked, who've, who've said, all these liquor stores, you know, all we see are people that are, you know, that are drunk sitting in front of the liquor stores. There's an increase in violence, there's an increase in crime, there's an increase in sexually transmitted diseases. I mean, there's so much, you know, that goes on when you have an, 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 a numerous amount of liquor stores. And not only that, liquor stores were staying open to like 3 a.m. And this was only happening in Patterson. It wasn't happening in the surrounding suburban communities. It was just happening in Patterson. So we fought for years to, to work with city council. We had youth that were front and center talking to city councilmen about what can we do to reduce this problem. Because, because we're seeing, we're youth, we're seeing adults engage in these risky behaviors. It, gives, it doesn't give us any hope. It, makes us, like, it, it mm -hmm. makes us see like, okay, maybe we should be doing this too. You know, adults have to understand, we're talking about recreational marijuana for adult use, I get that, you know, but we have to understand youth are looking at us. You know, we need to be their leaders and their role models. So one of the ordinances that we passed was to actually reduce the hours of operation for, for alcohol outlets so they could be closed at 10 p.m. instead of like 3 a.m. Because what we found by working with the police department was that um, the, the highest amount of police um, service, service calls were between the hours of 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and the majority of them were around liquor stores. So we did that last year, we got that passed, and, you know, hope, and, we, and because of that alone, there has been, been a reduction in crime in those areas. So I'm really proud of the work that we're doing, but I just really want to emphasize mm -hmm. that it's not just Patterson, Newark, and other urban cities have the same problem with high amounts of you know, alcohol outlet density, and we're starting to see it in Denver, where the communities of color in Denver have high amounts of marijuana dispensaries. We have to ask these questions. Why are suburban communities creating ordinances banning recreational marijuana already? They don't want it in their neighborhoods. They know what drugs do to their neighborhoods. They'll come to our neighborhoods and, and, buy, and, buy, and buy up the drugs, That's right. but they don't want it in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We have to really be aware of that and let's figure out what's going on. New Jersey, and I'm glad you mentioned the ordinances because that's what I was going to bring that up next. In New Jersey, currently, I believe we have over 50, maybe 60 by now, um, municipalities have passed ordinances where they are saying, we don't want pot shops in our, in our neighborhoods. What we found in Colorado and California, where, where are the, the shops? As you said, they're not in suburbia, they're in the inner cities. And you talk about the message that we're sending to our children, like, we don't care about you. Like, just walk past that every day on your way to school. And it's, it really is a, a much larger issue. And again, if there's anyone in the audience that has any, um, we have sample ordinances. Um, we have the mayor of Point Pleasant Beach who is here, and he, Steve Reed, stand up, Steve, wave, so everyone can see you. <laughs> they passed the first ordinance in New Jersey to keep the um, dispensaries outside of, uh, of their community. So I think that's a real piece that's, uh, again, it's something that, that citizens can get behind. And we have, like I said, we have sample templates. You don't have to do anything. Just take it to your council and say, we don't want this in our, our neighborhoods. But Mary Pat, mm -hmm. the, the big issue, I think, uh, Ms. Opara mentioned it, and that is the kind of adult versus kids, right? So the real question for the country is, okay, let's say you have somebody I like the gentleman in the back who keeps applauding for me every time I mention <laughs> marijuana, who, who wants to smoke marijuana, believes that adults should be able to do it. And I, as I said, I have no problem with that. But the question is, for his right to be able to exercise his civil liberty to smoke, is he willing to compromise the public health of our youth? That's the question for our country. Because with rights come with responsibilities. And, and nothing, nothing is free in this world. And if you want legalization, you have to own up to the consequences of commercialization on the public health and on this country, where not only do you have communities of color disproportionately impacted by it, 
But in a, in, in a depressed economy in many places of the country, where people are suffering from the displacement due to the shifting economy and therefore feel anxious about their financial future and unable to access mental health services and get the appropriate services like someone like I'm able to get. Marijuana is an easy way to treat those anxieties. For school kids who are worried about the angst of growing up and are worried about being bullied, you know, over the internet, someone says, that, listen, you can vape this and no one's going to smell it. You can just drop this in the e-cigarette and you're going to be all set. Mm -hmm. All I can say to you is we already have a growing acknowledgement of an epidemic of anxiety in this country, particularly amongst our youth and also amongst those most vulnerable populations suffering from the... Uh, marginalization in our economy, and they're going to be the groups that are most likely to self-medicate using this new substance. And that compounds the injustice. Uh, and I think we have, as Americans, have to think, what's good for our country? God forbid, in a me, me, me world where it's all about me, we ever think about our country again, where we're ever thinking about the patriotic faith that our forebears had when they said they're going to sacrifice in order to build a better country for the next generation. How much are we keeping that faith when we say, knowing full well the impact of these illnesses, that we're going to let something happen that we know the impact of which it's going to be, having seen it in these other states? Because the phrase goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And, it, and it's now not fool me twice, it's, it's fool like me five, how many states? Five, are, it's like five times. Like fool five me times. five times. <laughs> shame on me, me, me. Because there's no like ignorance here. Oh, we need to, you know, we can get you all the information. But God's honest truth is you, you don't really, this is like a gut check. If I have to convince you up, up here that this doesn't make rational sense, given the historic experience of liquor and, and tobacco, um, if you don't get it in your gut that this is just not good for our country and our communities while we're trying to fight a raging fire of addiction in this country, you know, that is the biggest public health threat of our nation and I frankly believe is an existential crisis for our country. What does that mean? <clears throat> it means that we're losing, while our, our overall survival rate, thanks to great breakthroughs for particularly cancer research, is allowing us to live longer lives, and, and thanks to uh, addressing other cardiovascular disease. In spite of all those expansions, the death rate due to mental illness and addiction is literally changing the overall life expectancy of Americans. This is not just a fringe health issue. This health issue affects our nation. And for us to say that it's okay, as Governor Murphy does, to commercialize this in light of everything else going around, I know what environment gives rise to that because I grew up in an alcoholic home where you basically deny things that are right in front of you that are dysfunctional and you shut down because it's too painful to think about. And I don't know what kind of denial it takes for someone in the face of all that evidence oh, to the contrary in our public health would say that they're going to stake this state's future on commercializing marijuana. I think, if, if I may, if yeah. I may add, I think Tom Save me. Save <laughs> me. Don't let me go on and on. <laughs> You've got to cut in with me. <laughs> I think often what happens um, is that people conflate 
decriminalization, recreational marijuana use, and medical marijuana use too. I think people don't really know the differences. So I think that's why you see a lot of support for legalization, because I think a majority of people do think that recreational marijuana and medical marijuana are the same thing. And they don't think, and they, th and they do, a uh, majority of people do support the decriminalization of marijuana, as, as do we. You know, I, I support it. And I, think I do too. I think there's a way to decriminalize marijuana that can protect everyone that, that, you, that uses it and can allow them to seek help that they may or may not need. But I, I do want to just talk to the audience a little bit about commercialization because I think that most people think marijuana that is being sold recreationally is just a plant, just a cannabis plant. I don't think they realize that marijuana industry is actually selling really potent levels of THC concentrated products and we may or may not know that THC is actually the ingredient in recreational marijuana or marijuana in general that, that, that makes you high but has also been associated with psychosis, memory development, um, even, you know, in, you know, behavioral, behavioral changes. So this is a very, you know, this could be a very, very potentially dangerous component. And what we're seeing is that the marijuana industry is, is selling, selling, let me see, oh yeah. For example, edibles, selling edibles, some edibles that we, that we have seen have had levels of like 80, 90% THC. That's ridiculous, right? This is not the, this is not the plant anymore. This is not the cannabis plant that everyone's talking about, like, oh, this is, this is a safe plant. To put it in context, so the, the old hippies that are in the audience and it's like, oh, what was the big deal? You know, it was, I smoked a joint. Yeah. What was the THC level so the back THC in the 70s? the THC level back then was about 4%. 4%. Now, when you look at street marijuana, um, the Drug Enforcement um, Administration has found that street marijuana has about maybe 8, 9% THC, as, as much as 12% THC. Now we're seeing that THC levels in, in products that are sold in, in Colorado and other states that have legalized recreational marijuana are as, as high as 80, 90%. So they're selling concentrates, they're selling marijuana THC oils. I just got back from Amsterdam, actually. Everyone knows what Amsterdam is so famous for. Um, and I went to do my own research. I didn't use. I went to do my, <laughs> I went to do my own research on, you know, I wanted to know how they regulated marijuana because a lot of pro-legalization pro, um, people often compare the United States to the Netherlands and say, well, Netherlands is doing it and they seem like a great place, it seems like a great place to live. But what I found with talking to marijuana sellers was that they don't even sell concentrates. They actually regulate THC. They don't allow more than 14, 15% at most THC to be in their um, marijuana products. They don't sell concentrates. They were looking at me like I was crazy, like concentrate. Like they, they were shocked to even hear that. They have a very, you know, they're, Amsterdam is, you know, has its own issues, but they were very shocked to hear about how America is doing marijuana, and they know that America, how we're doing it, is, is that we're allowing the big marijuana industry, we're allowing money to fuel addiction. The only way, the, the only way that we, that, that the governor and other states that want to legalize recreational marijuana is going to, how it's going to improve the economy, whatever promises they're making, the only way that they could possibly do that is by encouraging heavy users. Heavy mm -hmm. use. Right. I mean, you have to use heavy. Just recreational use every day, one, like once, no, but, once a week. Go, 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 go. We need to raise tax. We got more revenue we need yeah. here in New Jersey. So we're going to have to really step on yeah. the accelerator and get more New Jerseyans to use. Yeah. Because our revenue problem is going to be dependent on how much money we can garner yeah. mm -hmm. in order to make it such that this thing pays off. Yeah. Do you see the, the fallacy in this mm -hmm. idea that we only save our finances if we flush down our public health mm -hmm. down the toilet? Uh, does anyone ever see the, the real... Um, mm -hmm. And does anyone think that this is targeting uh, responsible adults? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, don't I, I know, personally but. don't know any adults that run out to go buy gummy, gummy bears in the middle of the night. You know, I don't. I don't eat gummy bears. <laughs> but they're selling, you know, weed infused gummy bears, lollipops, pop tarts, sodas now. Mm -hmm. I mean, is this the plant that we're advocating for? And don't and like and like I said, don't get me wrong. I understand that people do want to use recreationally. I get that. But you have to ask your legislators what are they doing to make sure that the marijuana that's going to be sold is actually marijuana, right? We have to understand, too, the social justice aspect. Public health is a social justice issue. I keep saying that over and over again. We have to put our health first before money. What about the argument that um, the money is all going to drug treatment programs? And, you know, the, the, and you know, that argument really makes Sound no sense familiar? to me, honestly. <laughs> you're increasing, you're increasing, you know, and, they promise that the money for marijuana is going to go to drug treatment, drug prevention. It's going to go back to the schools and communities of color. Communities of color are going to have first, first dibs on who's going to own dispensaries. It's preposterous to me. 
to increase access to drugs and then also simultaneously use that money to treat, to prevent the use of that drug and to prevent the, and to also treat that drug. That's it makes good. no sense, but that's what they're mm -hmm. promising us. Yeah. And, and what and happened what it, in Colorado? And what, and what it, rhetorical question. Ne, well, yeah, exactly, answer. what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but then also we have to, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot the point I was making. <laughs> about the money going to drug treatment. Yeah, I mean, we've talked to Colorado officials that have said they have not seen any money going to their schools, as promised, drug treatment or prevention. I mean, this is, you know, this is a, this, it's a ridiculous you know, issue. The only way to really prevent the use of heavy drug use is to not make that available. I mean, I think that's you know, very clear, not make the drug as available as, you know, as, as, it, as it, it is. So okay. another aspect besides the uh, health that's affected is the employment. Mm -hmm. Because most people don't realize that even if a state um, legalizes, that doesn't mean your employer uh, will allow you to be tested positive for it. You can't, that, that case has been tried in every place and there's a, eh, can't get away with it. So um, it's just worth knowing that in Colorado they now have to go out of state to hire people because there's not enough people in state that can pass a drug test. In many parts of this country that are pretty economically distressed, um, companies like Walmart and others cannot build a plant in these, and a store in these communities because they cannot find enough people to build it who are drug free or staff it who are drug free. And I just think it's worth acknowledging that um, there is a, another dimension to this besides the very real issues of addiction and mental illness as, because as we know these um, marijuana for, for some really um, instigate psychosis um, particularly given the high rates of THC in these products so um, I, I'm just trying to point out that there are, are a number of reasons. Um, so I also want to say, um, go, go back to <clears throat> where New Jersey is. New Jersey is one of the ten worst states in the nation for holding its health insurance companies, most notably obviously uh, Blue Cross, uh, accountable under the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So it's ironic that the governor says he's for commercializing, but has done nothing to correct the fact that this state is one of the ten worst states when you need to get access for addiction treatment. So how ironic is it that not only do you need to get more people to use, and then use that revenue to try to get pe less people to use, mm -hmm. and okay? I, yeah. And then... <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to say that you're going to commercialize this at the same time when you know it's going to increase the, the number of people who are going to need addiction treatment, but then have a state that ranks as one of the ten worst in terms of enforcing a law that says addiction should be covered uh, equitably in terms of uh, its insurance coverage. And I think another thing to point out is enforcement. You know, nobody's really talking about how this, how this is going to be enforced once it becomes legalized. How are we going to make sure that youth don't use? How are we going to make sure that people aren't using outside in public places? You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be neighborhoods where people are going to call and say, look, my neighbor's smoking weed all day. I don't want to smell them smoking weed. Police officer, you need to come and arrest them. And who's, who's going to be targeted? <laughs> Obviously, right? It's always the people of color that are always at, that are always at this receiving end of bad policies. You know, we really have to you know, understand that. And I'm in no way saying that Black people and Latino people use use more than than, than whites. I'm not I'm no way saying that. It's actually pretty equal, if not more, for for whites. You know, I'm just going to be you know very frank with that. But I'm very passionate about having people understand that, although I think that pro legalization people really do believe that this is a social justice issue. I understand your your arguments, but you have to really think about it. Is is the legislation written in a social justice way? I think it's written more in in a, in a money way. I've talked to legislators about the THC components and constant. They even they didn't even have no idea what I was talking about. They were like, "There's no THC limit." I'm like, "You wrote the you wrote the bill." You know, they really had no idea. This is a this is a problem that and 
And what I say is that if it does become legalized, and I've told legislators, look, I'm a public health, I'm a drug abuse prevention and, you know, expert, Mary Pat's an expert, you know, we're here. We're here if you need us as a resource to make sure that if it does become legalized, let's do this safely. We've made ourselves available for that. And I urge people that are, if you, you know, if after this you, you still like, look, I don't care what they say, I still, I still want my marijuana, that's fine, you know, you know whatever. But, th but think about the public health impact. Talk to your legislators, talk to your city councilmen and say, look, if this comes to our town, how are we going to protect our health? How are we going to protect youth? How are, they in, how are the police going to enforce this? How, who's gonna pay for that? Mm -hmm. How are we going to control people that are driving while under the influence? How are we going to control people coming into our state from Pennsylvania, New York, um, Maryland, coming into our state to buy marijuana, get on the train and then leave? How are we going to control that? Drug trafficking, you know, you have to answer these questions because flawed policies always impact the most vulnerable, always, mm -hmm. always. Talk about the, um, the drug driving issue that we're seeing in Colorado as far as uh, testing. So on what, the spot. what we've been seeing is that there is an increase in drug driving and the difficulty in having to regulate that is that no one is really sure how to even test drivers who are driving you know, under the influence, right? Like how do you, t because it's not like with, with alcohol where you could use a breathalyzer, you have to actually get like a blood test. And what, we, and what may you, we may or may not know is that marijuana stays, can stay in our system for as much as 30 days, right? So what we're seeing is that there is an increase in drug driving. There's no legislation to, that's, that's put out there to say, okay, we have to figure out a way to make this you know, safer for the public and how police officers are going to be able to test people that are under the influence of marijuana. How are we gonna protect other people? There's, I think there was recently an accident Mm -hmm. um, was in Virginia, I can't remember the state actually, where someone was driving under the influence of marijuana and ended up killing someone, right? Now that person, what's gonna happen to that person? Is that person gonna go to jail? How are they even going to prove that he was highly, like you know, how, how are we, it's such a blurred area that we don't even really understand it enough, we don't understand the science enough, mm -hmm. you know? So, so what we, what my stance is and what our, you know, what our stance is is really, Let's slow down with this legalization. You know, we, we, there's a lot of unanswered questions that we have. If this is a social justice issue, focus on decriminalization. Have the, Governor Murphy focus on decriminalization. Decriminalize marijuana for the whole state of New Jersey. Let's see what happens. The, will marijuana use go up? You know, will 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 you know will, will use among youth go up if we decriminalize? Let's see what happens. Start collecting data. Start talking. C c have a, a public health task force be on standby to, mm -hmm. to help with um, drafting legislation so that if you do want to legalize it, you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that we have money pushing us. You know, when, and when you have money and, and big marijuana industry and, and non-public health experts creating policies that, 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 that um, have a direct impact on our health, it's going to be flawed and it's going to mm -hmm. be very dangerous. The, um, the drug driving issue is also something, again, when you're speaking to your local council people, um, that's going to be an expense that's going to be pushed down to the local municipality yes. Yes. because to be um, to receive that certification DRE it stands for drug recognition expert and for the police to get receive that um, certification it's very very expensive we were talking to our, our colleague um, Peter um, Peter Brown, councilman Peter Brown, Brown mm -hmm. from, uh, from Linden. Linden he's a councilman and they have one DRE for the, the city of Linden so it's, that's clearly an unintended consequence yeah. that people are not looking at. Yes. Congressman, when you were in Congress, tell the audience how important it was to receive feedback from your constituents. Uh, well, obviously, um, you know, it was a different time when we were all agreed on the facts. And the only thing that differentiated us was our opinions. Now we have to not only argue our opinions, but we have to argue, well, which set of facts are you using? Um, we're really living in a different time, as you know, Mary Pat. It's a, it's a very uh, troubling, uh, because there's a lot of dissembling of the facts, and people just taking those facts that they want and then making the argument that they want. Um, so, you know, I, I just have to say I was blessed in Rhode Island. It was such a, obviously a small state in the country, very intimate. I know South Jersey has a lot of that. Uh, Everybody knows each other, related to each other, and so forth. Uh, went, went to school with each other. Um, 
So there, there was a very, for me, because I had a lot of, I mean, I was some, suffering from, uh, from alcoholism, addiction myself, and, and mental illness throughout my time in Congress. Um, but I had this great wellspring of support because, you know, they were like helping me along, you know, like they knew I was fighting for this thing called parity. Um, they knew that it was important that someone do it and someone do it that had the experience that I had. And, um, and basically I, I think I was always in a place where I was you know, helping my constituents and they recognized that. Um, I was on the Appropriations Committee. Um, there was this great story about uh, Willie Sutton, the great historic bank robber, and they asked him at one point, why did he rob the banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people ask, why was I on Appropriations Committee? Because that's where the money is. And I, so I was able to uh, really support my constituents. Uh, we had a lot of issues uh, that were important to them, national security. Um, principally because of the, the Navy being in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and a lot of military folks. I, I succeeded a guy who was a captain in the Navy. And, um, Don't you think that it's, it's important for people to reach out to their legislators, in this context, our state legislators? I certainly know when I was in the legislature, it really does make a difference when I hear from my constituents, when I hear from the people that I represent. Well, you know, too, in the state legislature, I was also in the state legislature, and that's where it really comes home because, you know, Frank DePaulo has a problem with you, you're in trouble, you know. If George Hoey is calling you up, or Evelyn Fagnoli, I mean, oh my God, <laughs> I mean, I am gonna be in trouble. Regulars. You better <laughs> like, yeah, they, you better jump when they say jump. So yeah, when you're local political figure, you have to do everything. You, you answer those calls, people come in, because you know only a handful of votes can make the difference mm -hmm. in an election. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, very good points. And, and who knows, depending on the demographics of the congressional districts, how that, that mm -hmm. also works. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think it's time for us to start taking questions. Does anyone have any questions? I'm sure this isn't a shy bunch. Do you want to come down to the microphone or if you could speak loudly? And if you please give me your name, state your name. Testing, okay. Good. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Krishna Patel. I am a, a public health student from University of Maryland College Park, and I am currently working as a health intern at Ringwood Health Department. Um, over the course of the year, I'm studying a master's in health policy analysis and evaluation. And my question is for uh, the congressman. Uh, as a former congressman, how do you think United States as a nation can work towards increasing bipartisanship and unity in such trying times where we have to sit here and really think over whether we care for the youth of the nation or not, because the current state of the nation sounds more divided on almost everything. Right. Thank you. So uh, thanks for giving me an easy one to start off with. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Solve all the world's problems. Um, so I've believed that uh, a neuroscience study of the brain is the most important, should be the most important national priority that our country f addresses. Uh, not only because of the real impact from everything from autism to Alzheimer's to addiction to anxiety, and then that's just the A's. I haven't even gotten into the B's <laughs> yet. Um, that these illnesses of the brain are literally taking our fellow Americans hostage and prisoner. You know, most notably our returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan who are suffering from what are known as invisible wounds of war, but there's nothing invisible about what these veterans have been suffering from, which are the signature wounds of war, post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. And they are literally um, in our midst as prisoners of war. Now, if they were over in Iraq, we would be sending in SEAL Team 6 
to go bring them home. But now that they got back, we're like, hey, you made it home? Fine. And we're not doing what we need to do to save them from the 23 suicides by our nation's veterans every single day in America. We lose more Americans in the military to suicide than killed in action. And that's just our veterans. So you want to talk about how to build bipartisan support? I would say get me any Republican. And I'd have a hard time finding a Republican that wouldn't support doing something for the veterans if they're to be true to their rhetoric that they're all about America and all about our veterans. And then I would say to them, if you think what a soldier saw in Iraq caused trauma, what happens to a child growing up in Patterson who sees a shooting? And that child doesn't have the same psychological preparation that one of our military members does. So what happens to all of those Millions of children going up in America today that watch one parent strike another in domestic violence. What kind of trauma is that setting off in those children? And by the way, they have no you know, psychological resilience courses like our members of the military have. So I would say that in this day and age, the thing that is going to differentiate my children's ability to compete in the world is their ability to be able to navigate stressful situations, to cope with stressful situations, to problem solve in a productive way. And by the way, those are all skills that aren't being taught in our schools. Um, and, the, and, and I'm happy to say my wife Amy is uh, leading the charge. I mean, some schools are doing it, excuse me, but. The 99% of public education in America does nothing to address our, our children's mental health through social emotional learning, and they need to. And for those that are out there doing this, thank you for being leaders in this space because we need more of you. So from that brain development phase to how do we understand the way the brain works so that we can better tackle how to address addiction, how to address dementia, how to address learning disabilities. Um, I believe we can do m miraculous things in terms of neuroscience. So over 50 years ago, President Kennedy led the nation to go to the moon. And he said that we were going to do it in 10 years, and we did it in 10 years. I think we need a president to make that same declaration but to understand the brain. And that's going to cost us a lot of money. I'm just here to tell you, it's going to cost us a lot of money. And that's, that's something that scares politicians. But I would say that we should float a savings bond like we did in World War II to fight the Nazis and to fight the fascists. We did whatever it took to win the war. And my view our survival as a nation, as a first-rate nation, is really going to be at stake, directly proportional to our ability to better understand, treat, and help those who suffer from neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. And our whole health care system is going to get sunk by this issue. Our lifetime expectancy is going to be impacted. Our success in education is going to be impacted. Our success in our criminal justice systems reforms is going to be impacted. Our success in our economy is going to be impacted. Central to our existence as a nation will be whether we're going to rise to the challenge and make understanding of our mental health and our neuroscience a top national priority. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Seriously. Questions? Yep. Well, if I can get to the microphone. Um, so mine has to do with decriminalization and legalization. So my main kind of devil advocate question. So with decriminalization, without legalization, the sale and distribution would ultimately fall into criminal, criminal enterprises. So how do you, what would be the recommendation in, to handle that? Thank you. 
with keeping social justice experts in mind because we know who is targeted by the criminal justice system. I could answer that. So yeah, that's a common question, um, and it, and it makes sense. You know, like why why do we why, if we decriminalize, we're going to leave the drug sale of you know of drugs to to drug dealers, right? But just to, just FYI, legalization is not going to stop that. The black market is still going to be there. In fact, it's actually going to thrive even more with, legal, with legalization. Uh, because people aren't going to want to buy things from or marijuana from their dispensaries. They're going to still want to buy it from their street dealer because it may or may not be, be cheaper. But I do think that it's important to focus on decriminalization so that we can take our time and figure out how to do legalization the right way. Like I said, I know people want to smoke their marijuana, that people want to, people love weed, I get that, you know, but I think it's important to, to address the possible negative health effects that are going to come when you start commercializing marijuana. It's important to, to understand just that legislators are allowing big marijuana and private, the private industry to come and start dictating policy. And that's very, very dangerous. So I think if we're, like Governor Murphy is saying, if we're going to make this a social justice issue, since he's all about social justice, let's focus on decriminalizing first. People are, I think New Jersey has one of the highest rates of arrest rates in regards to marijuana possession, right? So we need to address that. Um, and people of color are impacted more by that than, you know, than any other groups. So we need to address that. And I think decriminalization will help with addressing that if you do it the right way. And then later on, if we want to talk about legalization, we can do that, but do it safely and very restrictive. Next. <laughs> Good evening, days or good afternoon. Thank you for this most important forum. I think it's very unique, this topic, because it brings together, I'm Paul Danielchik, president of the NJ conservative GOP. It brings conservatives in lines with the Kennedy. Oh so. my God. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Just Vladimir uh, Lenin said, give me one generation of the youth and I'll transform the world. So I, I think there's something more going on with this. Just a couple brief points and then two questions. Uh, we were talking about the um, taxation. That's what the legislators push, taxation, taxation. And if you look at Colorado, a very small percent of the taxes goes to uh, fighting this problem it goes to mostly the law enforcement and the bureaucracy. So it's a loser as far as taxes. And in New Jersey, oddly enough, the use of marijuana is, with the youth is very small at this point. Guess what state has the largest 17 and under? Colorado. And you mentioned the uh, black market. Boy, if it becomes legalized in New Jersey, this is the perfect place for it. Being a sanctuary city, where do you think MS-13 is going to come to sell their wares? Do you have a question? Yeah, the question is, we have uh, forums like this, our groups had uh, meetings. How do we get, this is, the facts are on our side, no doubt, but the big money's on the other side. How do we get our message over that, with all the budgets they have to get their message out? How do we fight that? and Congressman Kennedy, what's your relationship with Governor Murphy? Um, so I have conveyed my position on this to the governor. Um, you know, after he first got sworn in, I was in the, on his transition team on health care. Um, but I'm still waiting for his administration to do something on my recommendations that they are not the wor 10 worst state in the nation following a federal law. I mean, it's, it's, you know, frankly, no, not to cast no aspersions to some states, you know, in the South, you would not expect New Jersey to be one of the 10 worst states in the country on a federal medical equal rights law that requires that these illnesses of the brain be treated the same and not force people uh, out of network so much in order to, and pay, have to pay more to gain access to these services. So I think he needs to separate the uh, division of banking and insurance and make it about insurance so that there's not this big cluster of issues that that director has to worry about. The, the director should be director of insurance and they should be responsible for holding the insurance companies accountable to the law. And if they cannot provide equal coverage to the people in New Jersey, then get out of New Jersey. We don't want you selling your insurance in this state if it's not uh, adhering to federal law even. 
let, let alone New Jersey law, and why no one's doing anything about that. I, I, I don't know. So, so that's an issue that ostensibly we agree on. The issue that we don't agree on is obviously commercialization of marijuana. So I am uh, in a little bit of a box here because I can't, frankly, my big, big target is accountability under the federal law I had an opportunity to sponsor. That's my number one priority. No, no uh, offense to my friends in the um, posing uh, marijuana, as you can tell, I feel very strongly about that too, but I can't even get any um, momentum going with the governor on, on that. So, uh, uh, and, and I, there's all kinds of ways to negotiate. And uh, I mean, it would seem to me he, he, he might want to do something about parity. Um, How do we counteract the pro side that has all the funds By with their propaganda? By educating ourselves. And that's, you know, I say we're the little engine that could. So I would say rather than, uh, I think the business community has been relatively silent on this. Mm -hmm. The chambers of commerce have really been falling down on this issue. And the big businesses, all these hospitals, first and foremost, all the hospital systems in New Jersey ought to be phoning Governor Murphy right now and saying, listen, this is going to jam our emergency rooms mm -hmm. even more than they're already jammed with all kinds of psychosis and other, you know, ancillary okay. effects to a commercialized product. We've seen it already in, um, in Colorado. So, you know, and then you could go on. Then I'd take the photo uh, of how they can't get enough uh, drug-free workers, and I would get that data, and I'd send it all around to the businesses in this state and say, why aren't you uh, business owners calling the governor and saying that this is something that's of importance to you? In other words, it's building that kind of coalition that we really need to, to, to build. Because mm -hmm. I think that those voices from the chamber would really ring heavily in the governor's office. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Teresa Tui, and I'm an advocate for brain, brain disease in Washington, and I work and I live in Pennsylvania. Um, Patrick, your work for Advocates for Recovery is really bipartisan with Speaker Gingrich and Van June. So I'm wondering with the, the plan, I'm finding uh, on the ground in Pennsylvania that there is huge bipartisan support for what you're doing over the long term for those major planks. I'm wondering on the drug court issue, I'm seeing a real bipartisan approach happening at the district judge level in Pennsylvania at the doors amongst Republican, Democrat, and independent voters. And I'm wondering if you could discuss those yes. uh, relationships I think I, with what yeah, I think, Teresa, it's a p great point. You know, I love the fact that uh, Pennsylvania's got the pathways to pardons, too. Right. So they're, they're doing all kinds of criminal justice reforms. But a lot of this is it's education of the local uh, law enforcement, and we're, we need to do it both for the addiction crisis and the mental health crisis because, frankly, there's got to be greater literacy amongst the potential arresting officer, for example, mm -hmm. that the person is suffering um, hallucinations due to some kind of a schizoaffective disorder as much or as they're maybe on, uh, addicted. So in both cases, they need to know how to respond and there are now new paradigms for law enforcement to respond, not by arresting, but by um, f making sure these individuals get access to treatment and, and, and get a, a treatment facility to see them so that they're not all, also languishing in these ERs. So, um, and there's, there's going to be real impact in terms of addressing our overall numbers in our jails and prisons if we can stop people from getting the original arrest. Um, and there's all kinds of pre-arrest and pre-adjudication. So you can even do so much. In, in Rhode Island, we had um, a veterans court in that addition to, yeah, we had a veterans court in addition to a drug court and a mental health court. Uh, happy to say it, I got those all funded. Um, and it was because I believe that veterans it was amazing. I got all the police officers coming up to me and say, can you do something because we're arresting our fellows. Mm -hmm. 
because in Rhode Island we had the number one percentage of um, law enforcement serving in military police in Iraq and Afghanistan of any state in the country and they were all part of our local police departments and when they got back from Iraq guess what they were doing they were arresting each other because no one was treating the post-traumatic stress and TBI so um, and now they have their own docket of issues and they're familiar and the judges are, are sharp to what the issues are so they can also hold them accountable and there's more treatment and understanding there so I think Listen, let's be honest, a lot of our criminal justice system are people who are suffering uh, from, uh, from untreated mental illness and untreated addiction. And if we can get our handle on that, we do a lot to address a lot of issues, including the overrepresentation, I think, um, of minorities in our criminal justice system, because the greater awareness overall about all of these issues, I think, will be very positive. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing bipartisan support at the local, state, and federal level on those issues around TBI, PTS, and around district court. Citizens understand at the doors how district judges affect them. And if you sit in a three hour session of any district court in any state, in America, in any city, any borough, it's all addiction cases. Just spend three hours doing that. It's a real education. I'd like them to be televised so people would get, continue to get that message. I wanted to thank you, Patrick, on the sensitivity that you and Amy expressed in your social media on Demi Lovato's setback. I think those are real opportunities to educate America on forgiveness, compassion, tenacity, recovery, and I hope you'll continue to do that. I know she's done great work with NAMI and National Alliance for Mental Illness. I think those type of compassionate opportunities are important for all of us, and I thank you for modeling that. Thank you very much, thank Teresa. You. And I just want to add to, I think it's important, I'm a, I'm a social worker, so I'm going to speak from a mental health perspective. I think it's important too to start normalizing mental health um, treatment in this country. I think we normalize drug addiction or we drug, drug use too much, that we think it's the go-to answer to dealing with underlying issues. But I think that people shouldn't, you know, the first time that people seek drug treatment or mental health shouldn't be after they've been arrested. You know, we have a, you know, we're starting to see a lot of support for drug courts and I understand that. But uh, drug, drug, um, drug courts and the mandatory drug treatments and mandatory you know, mental health treatments, but I think that we need to do a better job in preventing that from even happening, preventing it from even getting to the point where they're entering the criminal justice system and now they're doing this because they're mandated. People should really have the access to want to um, engage in drug abuse treatment or mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. That's good. good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for today, for taking your time. I wish we had these more frequently throughout the state. My name, can you hear me okay? Yep. No, I was going to say, give your, and what you do, because that's sure. very so, important. Mary, Pat, and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, my name is Alyssa Fornado regni and I'm a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. I'm also a student assistance counselor, a SAC, mm -hmm. uh, in Monmouth County School. And there are SACs across the, the entire state of New Jersey within your school systems. Yeah. Just be aware of that. Um, so if you know of anyone struggling, any, any youth struggling with addiction, it's really important to reach out to your SAC in your local school. Um, so my concern is youth, of course, and I also am a part of a new collaborative called the New Jersey Youth Rite of Passage Impact of Marijuana Legalization. Rite meaning R-I-T-E. Because we know that when parental use, when family members use, we are, and when just by setting a law, we are giving kids, whether we want to, whether we want to admit it or not, you're giving kids the rite of passage. We really have to be real about that. Um, so just to give a couple of statistics, and then I'm going to follow with a question. Um, so Dr. Maurice Houston states, he did his research, and he stated that, six, that adolescents are six times more likely to use pot simply because of parental attitude or indifference. Um, adolescents' heavy teen use of marijuana results in an eight-point decrease in IQ. Daily teen users are 60% less likely to complete high school, seven times more likely to attempt suicide, and eight times more likely to use other drugs. So with the transparency on the state level, my concern is what is the discussion if the governor is planning on, if the legislature is planning on legalizing marijuana, what are they talking about in terms of how to address all of the new addiction issues that are going to arise? in the near future, because I'll be honest with everyone in this room, when the governor 
with all due respect, when the governor announced over a year ago that he was going to legalize marijuana, New Jersey schools across the entire state, all of us SACs, saw an increase in vaping within the schools. I'm sure that at least 75% of you in this room have, are aware of that, are aware of the vaping that goes on in the schools. So with that being said, we're, and this year, this year it really ramped up for us in the schools. So with that being said, we're very concerned once it, once it becomes legalized, this is going to get out of control very quickly. Yeah, no, it's, I can feel your frustration. I share your frustration. The facts should matter. The data should mean something. That's what we pay for it for. That's why we invest in it, is because we hope that if we get the data, that it actually informs policy. Yeah. policy. So it's very troubling that it's not happening. And in spite of the data, a very intelligent, thoughtful, uh, well-meaning person in the governor has been co-opted by this, this uh, impression that everybody is for this. And frankly, I think that that's a bad reason to do something that really has deleterious impact when you've got the trust responsibility for the people of the state that you're in charge of, one. But I think I can say for a fact, I'm doing what I can. Listen, I, I you know, as you saw, I've got five, <laughs> five kids, and I love what, living in New Jersey. I stood up in my little brigantine town council. Thank God they decided not to permit the uh, retailing of this and so forth. But, and, and wherever I can help, I, I'm helping. I can say for a fact, that in five years from now, people who supported this are going to regret that they supported this. Because Colorado's already regretting it. Listen, Hickenlooper is backtracking as fast as he can backtrack. And he's running for President of the United States. Boy, he's going to have his hands full. Mm -hmm. trying. Now, for if he's got a race of 20 people running in the Democratic primary, which it looks as though he'll have, then maybe he'll be able to run on this somehow because he'll have that you know, lane of people that's, you know, wh wh who we know, right, on the left. But um, this is just bad, bad, bad. There's no other way. When you look at that science, listen, I'm not, I, I know I get worked up about this, but I'm listening to the director of the most important and greatest research institution in the world on drug research, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. And Nora Volkow is unequivocal on this issue. So, you know, I say to myself, you know, I, it doesn't make sense to me kind of knowing what I know about addiction, you know, just because I'm someone who is in recovery, I know this stuff. But when I listen to the experts, and by the way, there is no one on the scientific research side, major medical institutions, that contravenes the fact that commercialization is bad for this country. So I don't know, in light of all of that, the fact is they haven't been willing to step it up as much to the previous gentleman's uh, points. These chambers of commerce have just been laying down and they're gonna be directly impacted. These hospitals laying down, they're gonna be directly impacted. They need to put some money behind this, honest to God. Mary Pat knows if you wanna fight a successful campaign, you need money. And unfortunately, no one's been willing, save a few, to really put some real uh, dollars uh, uh, behind this. Mm -hmm. Knowing the good news, there's, I'm sorry, just, but just real quickly, the good news is in New Jersey, Governor Murphy did come in and say within the first 100 days of his administration that marijuana would be legalized. So we pushed it back to now it's over, he's, it's 205 days he's been in office. So we have been able to, to push the, the rock up the hill. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. A couple more questions we have time for. So good evening. Uh, my name is Inua Momodu. I, I'm from Atlantic Care. Uh, I'm the chairman of psychiatry in Atlantic Care Regional Medical Center. And I'm a child psychiatrist. The psychiatrist and the child psychiatrist, and I do a lot of addiction work. Um, thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you, uh, doctor. It is uh, uh, disheartening uh, that we, in, in this day and age, are sitting down when we know the facts mm -hmm. of what this is going to do to our community 
and our future. Uh, it's going to devastate our youths. We've talked a lot about the cognitive impact of this disease, the psychosocial impact, the social justice impact. But what about the physical impact of this disease? I mean, we know THC uh, has more carcinogen than cigarettes. Mm. Nobody's talking about that. We also know that the nicotine, um, um, uh, the nicotine, nicotine contents of THC also causes a lot of vasoconstriction, mm. and that leads to more cardiac diseases, increases in strokes, decreases in lung function. So there is not just a psychological impact and a social impact, there is an actual physical impact of this disease. There are gonna be more increases in diseases that are not even psychologically related. Mm. We don't even want to go into the issue of early use, people say, oh, it decreases anxiety. That is true. Chronic use increases anxiety 10 times more. We forget all the negative impact this is going to have on us, and yet we, for commercial reasons, are allowing this to happen. My question is, is it too late? Can we reverse this in New Jersey? Well, first, doctor, thank you for uh, really elucidating in a way that was so powerful. I, I just, I, I'm glad this was being recorded. Your synopsis of the impact of this vis-a-vis -vis things that uh, even I'm not familiar with in terms of the uh, carcinogens in this, the vascular uh, impact of uh, THC and the like, very enlightening. And given the fact that not only are you psychiatrist and director of Atlantic Care, but you're also a child uh, psychologist, a psychiatrist, and you, by the way, child psychiatrists are the most endangered uh, 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 professionals around. There are just, I mean, there are just too few of you, and we are so blessed that you came, and it was very impactful that you're here today. I hope those that are reporting on this event make note of the fact that you are here. I think it makes a big difference in terms of uh, uh, the validity of what's being imparted to this audience. So uh, with that, it, it is easy to feel frustrated. And I might add, not just on this issue, but in the state of the world as it is today, given what's going on in Washington and around the world, it's very easy to feel very overwhelmed and just wanting to go and hide. <laughs> right, because it feels like this is too much for me to take on. But all I can say is uh, we can't control the world. All we can do is control our little piece of it. And we're only responsible for doing what we can do. In your life, doctor, you are knocking it out in what you're able to do in your life. And all we can be responsible for as citizens is to do our part. So, uh, and we always have to try to do more and do better. I think if enough of us continue to do it, who knows, there will be some victories. And as Mary Pat said, let's count the ones we already have because it, actually it is a re reflection of the great pushback that, that the state's not run into this already within the first 100 days. Um, and, and we're gonna have more elections and people, this thing is, there is an, a ripple effect from today and uh, from other events like this that we can't immediately know. So all you can say is I hope that there was something that comes from this that can somehow in a small way help reduce the chances that this actually ends up happening. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't throw up our hands. Uh, and I thank you for doing your part to stand up. Thank you, Doctor. My name's Adam Lush, I'm with Ambrosia Treatment Center. Um, we provide treatment for substance abuse. Um, uh, Congressman, I wanted to thank you first for your work with Parity. Yeah. I've been involved with NCAD and the Parity Coalition. I'm on a provider work group where we're trying to get information from providers out to Congress so it can inform the decisions they're making regarding Parity legislation. Um, my real passion is prevention and you know, I taught in schools, I really went around teaching prevention and I talked to a lot of you know, young kids about substance use, my own experience, I was addicted to marijuana from age 13 to 19. Yeah. And when I would talk to these students, it, it's, I'm seeing the parallels here. It's like the state is a, you know, 
16 year old kid who I'm saying it might not be a good idea for you to try marijuana because there's going to be consequences down the road. Right. And this legislation is anti prevention. Yeah. It's the opposite of that. Right. So, you know, looking at, I, I really, you know, interested in your comment on how this anti prevention legislation is going to manifest into these consequences down the road and particularly based on you know what i'm based in in treatment the cost of treatment because the cost of treatment right now to do it well is very resource intensive and that's, that's right. the challenge trying to get people enough resources that need it to get the treatment that they need so if that's increasing the demand increasing the need for treatment and making it more challenging for people to find long-term and lasting recovery you know, what's that cost going to turn into and how does this anti-prevention legislation cost us in the long run? So as we both know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we need a system in healthcare where we screen people for high risk. And we need to factor in the ACE study, the adverse childhood experience. We have to factor in family history of addiction. You know, they ask us, do we have a family history of cardiovascular disease or cancer? But why aren't our doctors asking us if we have a family history of mental illness or addiction or alcoholism? My point is, is that the best way to treat addiction is to prevent it. That, that's often not said amongst the treatment field. Like the best treatment is actually prevention. Cost pennies on the dollar and its impact is far greater. And frankly, it goes in line with psychosis, like the best treatment for schizophrenia is to treat it right away. But we let people with schizophrenia have multiple psychotic incidences before we even wrap our arms around them and say, listen, let's get you some help. When if we had given them the help at the first time, they would have permanently been better off in terms of their life course with the illness, right? Because it would have prevented the, de the, the, the pathology of the illness from taking place. Same with addiction, same with mental illness. We need to be in early. By the way, that this is the standard for care for cancer. Mm -hmm. It's stage one. But in our illness, we wait until you get really, really bad, you know, stage four, and then we say, oh, listen, let's see if we can get you some help. Can you talk to anybody? Oh, by the way, where is our treatment center that I can afford and that it's in network? Mm -hmm. And then you're up a creek. So our fundamental thinking on this has to change. Yes, we need treatment for the people who are really ill today with addiction, but our long-term plan ought to be making brain health part of overall health so that we have a, quote, checkup from the neck up. That's my big campaign. Across the life cycle. And that we have um, brain health kind of barometers that you can get a, a scale and then you throughout your life just like they do with kids uh, trying to prevent concussions they know what their baseline is in case they do get a concussion we need the same across the life cycle and the fact that insurance is not reimbursing for this CMS is not reimbursing for this right. that the brain the most important organ in the body is not getting attention is shocking in this day and age so I just thank you for your advocacy for prevention. It's thank really you. well founded. Thank you. Thank you. Last two questions. Hi. Um, my name is J.D. Mullane. I'm a local columnist for the Burlington County Times newspaper in Willingboro. And thanks for the opportunity for allowing me to, to speak to you today. But I was wondering if um, you think all of this, legalizing weed, uh, 64,000 Americans dead last year from opioid addiction um, are really symptoms of something deeper in, in, in America and something that's really not discussed all that often and that's a crisis of, of spirit, a spiritual crisis. Um, you know, our, our houses of worship, uh, our clergy uh, failing us like so many other once revered institutions in this, in this great country. Um, and if not, what uh, possible program or policy from the government can help? What's your thoughts on that? Um, first of all, uh, I 110% agree with your preposition, proposition that it's a, 
uh, we have a psychic pain, okay? So I believe that a lot of people were prescribed Oxycontin because they didn't have access to antidepressants and frankly their pain that was really physical was really, there's a lot of psychosomatic which was really a result of the fact the economy fell out in 2008 and which is when this thing really took off. People feel like their financial futures are uncertain, which they are. They don't see anyone in Washington leading on an economy that includes people and gives people ladders, like shoots and ladders, remember that game? It's all shoots. No ladders for people to get the next rung up, get training, and to participate in an economy where wealth is being concentrated more and more in fewer and fewer hands. And even now, the Congress is thinking about reducing the capital gains. After they gave $2 trillion, 95% went to the top 5% in America. That's the real outrage in all this. And then you wonder why people are working harder in multiple jobs, feeling frustrated, can't get ahead. They got lots of child care issues, housing issues, health care costs, everything. And they're overwhelmed and they're anxious. And I think that kind of psychic pain is, is definitely something that is real. And I do think the fact that there is no compassion for people who are, who are suffering out there in general. Like you said, there's a, a void in terms of our, our spiritual connectedness. I think the, the same thing that's happening to minorities with the criminal justice system, which we see play out over and over again, tragically, one YouTube video after the next, same thing we see with our Hispanic brothers and sisters who are being stigmatized because they're all monolithic, um, illegal alien, and, and the same way we see other minority groups stigmatized, I think there's a general sense that, you know, we're all, but for the grace of God, that next target group, you know, and, and I think it's incumbent upon us to have a shift in our psyche as a nation, to think of all of us as brothers and sisters. It's not a, it sounds kind of trite, but it goes to the spiritual element that you're, you're asking about. Because if we can't treat each other as we ourselves would want to be treated, then guess what? We're all in trouble in a world that is coming apart because of all of these other forces. And so I think it does, at the end of the day, rest with a very strong moral compass. And by the way, whatever religion or faith the, those religions all have the same architecture, which is the golden rule. Treat others as you yourself would want to be treated. That's a pretty good one list that you don't need to go down the list of commandments or the seven deadly sins. Just treat one another, and that would kind of get us off to the right start. And uh, I, I frankly um, hope that we're, we're going to get more people to talk about the need. I know in recovery today, um, my life is better than it's ever been because I'm present for my children. I'm, I'm faithful to my wife. Um, I, I try to help people around me. I'm conscious as to whether I succeed in any of that on a given day. I, am, I always succeed on being faithful to my wife, by the way. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, but I, I'm serious. Like there's uh, Those seven deadlies were arrived at for thousands of years, you know, pride, anger, envy, you know, lust, gluttony, sloth. You'll have to fill me in on the two that I just left out. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is they're pretty good guideposts and just for life. And they don't have to belong to any particular religion. And I know that if I weren't um, able to be in 12-step recovery, I would have no guide for life. Honest to God, I would have no guide for life. Even though I go to church and everything else, there's nothing that speaks to me like God speaks to me but, through but my Patrick, fellows. Our, you know, our church, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, gets something like a half a billion dollars from federal and state governments every year. And they're not talking about this. So I just spoke to Cardinal Supich the day before yesterday. Cardinal Supich is perhaps one or two of... Uh, His Holiness's best friends. He's the Archbishop, uh, the C Cardinal of, 
of Chicago, and um, he has been at every one of my events on this, and he has family issues, and he's been willing to be out there amongst it and lead with all of his pastors on this, and he's, I mean, not for nothing, he's going to talk to the Holy Father about this. I said, they had this um, big Vatican thing on health care, okay? They sponsor all kinds of events, but there's this big thing on health care. I haven't seen anything having to do with addiction or mental illness, right? Um, and uh, he said, I'm going to go around, <laughs> snoop around the vat. I'm going over there to see the Holy Father twice in September, and I'm going to go ask him about, you know, whether w there isn't something we can do about this. I'm just saying, yeah. uh, uh, we all have to keep pushing. And uh, I, I was lucky that I got asked by my uh, church to speak at St. Thomas and Brigantine uh, about addiction. And I, I said to um, uh, His Eminence Cardinal Supich, I said, you know, when are the pastors going to ask those of us in recovery in our churches to help our fellows in recovery? Because guess what? After I spoke, I've been inundated in the years since I spoke at St. Thomas by my fellow parishioners at St. Thomas Church in Brigantine with their family stories and history. And they, they didn't have any place to go in their church and that shouldn't be the case. So when I'm filling out my Catholic Strong after just having maxed out on my bishop's appeal, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, that the, the church is doing something on these issues because they need to step up um, for their sake and, 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 and for ours. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And they don't. They're not. You know, they're leaving us, they're leaving the government to handle these, these problems. I had coffee with Senator Acacia, I'm from Bucks County, PA, and he drops by so often. And he, he told me uh, that, you know, it's a spiritual crisis and there really isn't anything the government can do. They can only do so much. And beyond that, you know, as lives get more secular, they get more anxious and then we see all these problems. But the, the question remains, what do we do? I mean, if you gotta push soupage, you know, one of Francis's hand-picked guys, to talk about this in the city of Chicago, the, 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 the priorities are, are really screwed up because 64,000 Americans dead, more than all that were killed in Vietnam. That's just in one year. Just in one it's year. gonna happen in this year. And I'll tell you, I live in Levittown, PA, that bastion of that land of milk and honey for that post-war generation uh, that your Uncle Jack so well represented. And uh, outside our uh, ambulance squad, on New Falls Road, they have a marquee. It used to have uh, advertised handbag bingo and, uh, and pancake breakfasts. Uh, for the last three years, it's recorded the number of overdoses and the deaths from those overdoses. And driving here today, I passed it. It's up to, since January 1st, it's 283 overdoses. This is middle class America and 14 deaths. So by the end of the year, it's probably gonna be 600 and probably about 30, which is what it was last year and the year before that. And I think our clergy have a role in this. Our houses of worship have a role in this. Our church has a role in this and they're completely silent or virtually silent. I'm sure there are people toiling in vineyards, but what can we do about it? I mean, we could talk about programs and these are all wonderful things and fight Governor Murphy, but uh, because we know what's coming down the pike once recreational weed comes online in this state and in my state, in New York and Delaware. Uh, you know, but those guys, I don't know what they're doing. This is their wheelhouse, spiritual, anxious. Yes, you right. know? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have um, a time commitment because uh, there's another event coming in right at three o'clock, I believe. So if you could just ask sure. the question, Absolutely. please. Question. My name is Laurie Smith. I work for Atlantic Prevention Resources, coordinate the drug-free grant here in Atlanta County. And my question is things that the federal government could be doing that they're not. And I know they've rescinded the coal memo, they have stopped the uh, marijuana industry within the banking industry and you know, removing the Canadian investment. What about like we did in 1988 with rate, uh, removing highway traffic safety funding from states that did not raise the drinking age to 21? So the states that have legalized it, why not begin removing that funding from those states or other things that could be done on a federal level? I love that thinking uh, that's a that's a big hammer that politically would never 
in my view, probably have much chance given the uphill battle we have just stopping this stuff in the first place, just knowing the politics in America right now. But I love your thinking. And we need to have a creative thought process in terms of what new policies can slow this down or put us in a better position to stop it, right? So I, I, I love uh, your, your points on all that. I would say at the Kennedy Forum, um, org, people can get a member's guide uh, for members of Congress. It's a very 101 rough outline of a whole host of issues having to do with mental health and addiction. Uh, not particular to uh, legalization per se, but just a whole host of things. Um, and so we have to keep pushing back. And I, um, I thank you for doing it. I would say that on this parity thing, for example, there are innovative ways we can put pressure locally. Like if a company has an insurance company that gets a bad rating on parity, then you can put a leaflet out one morning to all the employees going in saying, did you know that your health insurer has got a bad rating on, in terms of guaranteeing equal access for mental health and addiction? That would really go right up to the C-suite level pretty quickly and get them to rethink what insurance company they have and what they're telling that insurance company they want them to cover. Because I guarantee most employees do not know that their employer-sponsored health care is very deficient when it comes to guaranteeing equal access to mental health and addiction as it would guarantee access for some other physical illness. So I, I think there, th we have to come at this from a lot of layers. We've got to do the prevention, but we presumably, if you're here and you don't want to see this thing um, commercialized, for those of you who are here for that reason, that we also have to be about treatment and early intervention. Um, and then people say, oh, it's going to cost us a lot of money to treat. Well, in, until the insurance company has the liability of having to pay for treatment, they're never going to pay for prevention because they're never going to see that as a, a liability cost for them not, uh, you know, investing earlier. Um, so there are lots of ways that we can go at this. I would hope that people leave here feeling as if uh, we're part of a larger mission to keep people mentally healthy and physically healthy, and that should be a good thing for their families, for our community, for this state, and, and for our country. And uh, that's a very noble thing to be working on. I thank you for doing, for doing what you're doing. Thank you. And thank you. Let's give Patrick and Ejima, Joma <laughs> a round of applause, please. I hope that that you learned something. I, again, urge you to contact your state legislators. Go to nj-ramp.org, and there's a very easy one, two, three. You can click within two minutes. You can get a letter to your legislator. And I just want to end with this quote from Margaret Mead. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. We can change this. This is not inevitable. So please help me in the fight. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great.